going to college is a pretty big endeavor for a lot of people, for most people. And um, being that it's big, it also has a kind of a big price tag associated with it. Um, according to the Sally May Foundation, funding college in 2019 and 2020, um, average families spend $30,000 per year. Um, I did a little research and for UW-Madison for in-state tuition um, is $26,500. And that's, um, I should say not just tuition, but in, it also includes housing and books and things like that. Out of state is 53,000. Um, and that's a year. And so tuition is roughly um, 9,000 for in-state, um, or a little bit over that, about 9,300 some, per semester. Um, for technical colleges, it's about half that. It's roughly 4,000 or 4,500. Um, so a lot of students choose to go to technical college um, and work on their liberal, liberal arts credits and then maybe transition into a college or some students attend technical colleges and get an associate degree or certificate and that may be the end, that may be their career goal. So there's different options and um, my point is that the price tag sounds pretty hefty, um, but there's there's lots of options. And then to go along with that, 50% of families used um, some sort of scholarships to help offset costs. And one really positive thing is that um, millennials with a high school diploma, or I guess, it's coming from the negative side, but millennials with a high school diploma earn 62% of what a high school graduate earns. So um, that earning over lifetime is an average of a million dollars more for persons who attend college versus those who don't. So um, it's, it makes a huge difference. Um, and then I'll say that along with going to college, um, aside from the getting a degree and hopefully a career, um, there's so many other factors that are involved in it. And I think that's even more so for blind and visually impaired students. Um, for most students, it's the first time they'll be living away from their family home. Um, so there's the whole independence thing. Um, gaining a social life, uh, making a whole, whole new network of friends and um, all sorts of related things like that, hopefully making career contacts. And uh, so just to put things in perspective a little bit, um, a couple of terms to think about um, while we're talking about things this afternoon. Um, grants versus loans. So grants are typically money that does not need to be paid back. Loans are typically money that is borrowed to you and then you need to pay it back at some point. But there are some exceptions for that as well with uh, loan forgiveness programs and things like that. Um, and then need-based awards versus merit awards. So um, Need-based is something that's based on your financial situation that um, you qualify to gain awards. Merit-based is based on performance, often academic or um, extracurricular things such as sports or um, music, things like that. Um, so, those are some good terms to keep in mind. Um, so one of the first things that any 
student or family who is seeking financial assistance will need to do is the FAFSA or free application for federal student aid. And that is something that you will need to complete every year while you're in college or actually the year before you're starting um, if you are hoping to get financial aid. Um, and that's something that you um, will need to sit down with your parents and do because it'll require um, like information like tax information from your parents and they'll look at whether or not you have siblings attending college and um, living expenses and things like that. The deadline for um, to begin completing the FAFSA is October 1st for the following year. So if you're planning to go to college in 22, you can start October 1st of 21. If you're planning to go to college um, this fall, hopefully you've already completed the FAFSA. And um, the deadline is June 30th for federal financial aid um, in that there, there's also deadlines that vary from college to college. So um, it's really important to keep deadlines in mind. But um, again, the FAFSA is a very important thing to complete. And once you complete the FAFSA, it will reveal um, what type of financial aid you will get. And um, the three options are loans, grants, and or work study. Um, so we talked about loans. Those are typically, typically need to be repaid grants. Um, there's something called a Pell Grant, which is a federal grant, which students often get. And that does not need to be paid back with a few exceptions. If you drop out of school, um, then it will need to be paid back. Um, and then work study is when typically you are awarded a job on campus and then that money um, goes towards offsetting your cost of college. So you can use the money for your living expenses or paying your tuition or your books or whatever. Um, again, deadlines are very important because they vary from school to school and um, it's, something you really need to pay attention to. I'm going to talk about a couple of pre-college programs because I think that um, the best way to get prepared for college is to do so um, prior to and starting early. The earlier, the better. And um, fortunately, there's several programs. It initially was three programs called TRIO, um, but that has now extended to eight programs and these are um, federal programs and um, they target underrepresented students, first generation college students and ec economically disadvantaged. So um, I'm thinking that most blind or visually impaired students will, would qualify for those programs. Um, I know myself, I was first generation um, blind and visually impaired are definitely underrepresented, I think, in college. Um, over the years, there's been something called the National Longitudinal Transition Study that compares um, college attendance rates, among other things, of people with disabilities comparing to people without disabilities. And uh, people who are blind with low vision definitely are below. Um, people without disabilities in those categories. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these programs, but I'll say that um, most of them are associated with UW campuses and some of them are like a cooperative between the campus and a, and a school. Um, so there's the GEAR UP, which stands for Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergrad Programs. Um, Another one is Upward Bound for first generation and economically disadvantaged students. And then a third one is Ronald E. McNair, and that is a federal program which is designed to prepare students for 
graduate studies. So I'm guessing that most of the students here today are not ready for graduate school yet. Um, graduate school, if you don't know, that means that you have already gained your or completed your bachelor degree and then you're going on for typically a master's or a doctoral degree. But it's a really good thing to know about if you're planning on that. So um, keep in mind. And then there's a list of the cities um, and links for more information. For most of the things I'm talking about, um, there's links associated with them um, in the presentation notes. And there's a list of the cities that um, in Wisconsin where those programs take place. The other um, really important initiative is something through the Department of Public Instruction. It's called dual enrollment. And what dual enrollment is, it's a program where um, high school students are able to gain college credit while they're still enrolled in high school. And um, A lot of times um, students will take a college or technical school class or two and get credit for that. And I believe the school typically pays for that or at least part of it. Um, I think that students may have to pay part of it. I don't know all of the details on that. But um, the Wisconsin School for the Blind and Visually Impaired has a program called the CCR program, which is college and career ready. And that is basically a transition program. In many schools, they're called 18 to 21 programs. There's various names for them. Um, but they work on um, transition skills. So it could be employment or it could be post-secondary, like going to college. And we've had several students who have attended our school through that program and have taken classes at either Blackhawk Technical College or UROC. Um, and the really important thing to know about dual enrollment is that while you're still in high school, you're getting the supports you typically would get through your IEP. So once you graduate from high school and you get your diploma, you no longer have an IEP. When you go to college, um, you will not have an IEP. And they are not required to provide accommodations unless you request them. So it, that's a really important piece of information to know. Um, so it, it, the dual enrollment really helps with the transition piece because students are able to get those supports and it helps them to prepare for when they graduate and they no longer have those supports. Um, so in summary, planning for college should begin early and I'd say as early as middle school. And um, while you're in high school or middle school, you can have IEP goals relating to um, college prep. So things like, um, self-advocacy, study skills, assistive technology. I've seen IEP goals relating to visiting college campuses, and that could be either with the orientation and mobility instructor, or it could involve the family um, taking the student to visit a campus. So um, those are important things to remember. Um, I'm gonna talk about some resources here. How am I doing on time, Kay? That section is almost at 14 minutes, Dave. You're a little over. Okay. Um, transition to college um, program activities guide for blind and visually impaired students is a great resource through the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, I've known about APH since I was a kid. I always saw that um, when I would read Braille books that they came from there, but I really learned more about APH since COVID just because they're such a huge presence. They have so many um, webinars and things going on. And this is one of the resources. Um, it's part of their, what's called their Connect Center. And um, 
there's something called Family Connect and then Career Connect. And this, um, the transition to college is part of the Career Connect program. And it's, uh, it includes 24 lessons ranging from col um, college application, writing essays and requesting accommodations. Um, The, the guide covers uh, researching admissions requirements, navigating the application process, requesting accommodations for SAT or ACT, applying for scholarships, grants and loans, um, ordering materials in accessible format, establishing re working relationships with uh, disability services on college campuses, um, coordinating services with vocational rehab, using knowledge of rights and responsibilities relating to disability, uh, independent travel, self-advocacy, self-determination, and hiring and working with readers. So as you can see, it's really comprehensive. And uh, for the educators, um, it really, it, it covers like, pretty much everything relating to transition and the expanded core curriculum, um, which is a set of curriculum in addition to the, um, the standard curriculum, such as reading and writing, math and things like that. The expanded core is a set of activities specifically for blind and visually impaired students. So um, I think that it's a really comprehensive guide. And I think that it's, it, if students go through that, you're really gonna hopefully really be prepared for college. Um, so uh, another um, resource that we have is called the um, Scholarship Application Organizer. Um, and this was created by Cindy Lambert, who is a teacher of the visually impaired out in the field. And she shared this with us. And it's a great way to keep track of um, due dates, and it's it's a it's it's a spreadsheet, and you're able to put in the scholarships you've applied for and due dates, and whether or not um, you need letters of recommendation, things like that. So I would really recommend that students use this or something similar because I think that for every student, um, the scholarships that you're applying for are gonna be different. There's um, many blindness related scholarships, um, such as those through the Wisconsin Council of Blind and Vision Forward and, and others, National Federation of Blind, but um, for every student, it's gonna vary depending on what college you attend. Um, different organizations you may belong to. I suggest talking to your um, guidance counselor at your high school. They often know of scholarships. Um, parents often maybe belong to organizations like Sons of Norway or Lions Clubs, things like that. Sometimes employers offer scholarships. So um, it's really important to be organized. And then, um, a big part of, probably the most important part of applying for scholarships is the essay and letters of recommendation. And um, I've, over the last month or two, I've had the honor of um, being able to review scholarships for the whole Herb Cole Fund. And I will say that um, a lot of times the essays are what make the applicant or would break the applicant. Um, you could have a mediocre application, but an outstanding essay that really persuades the reviewer, uh, vice versa. You could have a really good application and then an essay that's just lacking. So um, Dave Hyde was gonna talk about that for a couple of minutes. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, the scholar, there can be a lot of students with excellent GPAs good transcripts, good letters of recommendation, and so on. After all, who's going to submit a bad letter of recommendation? But it's your essay that is going to talk to the committee. So you want to make sure that essay does a couple of things. 
You want them to know who you are, what you participate in, and why you are a good candidate for their scholarship. They aren't just giving away money because they've got too much of it. They are honestly looking for the next generation of leaders. And it's up to you to sell them on the idea that you are a leader and that you're going to contribute in whatever field you plan to go into. For that reason, write it like a final exam. And after you write it, get other people to look it over for you. Help them check your wording, your grammar, your spelling, your punctuation, all of those things, because they are going to be seeing a lot of those and you want yours to stand out. I participated on a committee that got 500 applications every year. And out of those, maybe 40 or 50 stood out. The rest of them, eh, not so much. So give that your best work and treat it like it's one of the most important documents you're going to write, because it is. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about before we let our guests speak is the Division of Vocational Rehab. Um, and I, I will say right now that um, students or families um, I am available to work with you um, individually because, since this is so uh, specific to each individual. And the information we're providing today is very general in such a short time frame. but um, people can do outreach requests and I can work uh, more on um, identify, helping students identify scholarships and things like that. But um, the Wisconsin Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or DVR is a, it's a federal agency. And um, hopefully students who are listening now have already applied to DVR. Um, students are, it's suggested that they apply at 16, at the age of 16, but um, Students can apply at the age of 14 now that they have a lot of transition services available. And the, the goal of DVR is to assist people with disabilities in attaining or getting prepared or gaining employment. And um, they have a document that is called an IPE or Individualized Program for Employment. And um, the important thing to know about that is if you're going to college that your um, your employment goal must be aligned with what you're going to college for. And if that is true, um, DVR has something called a training grant and they can pay up to $5,000 a year or 2,500 per semester. Um, towards college. And that, again, is based on needs similar to the FAFSA. Um, and um, you do not have to pay it back. And that could be money to help offset tuition, or it could be used for um, assistive tech. Um, sometimes DVR pays for orientation and mobility on a campus, various things like that. Um, so there's links in there. Every a high school in the state of Wisconsin has an assigned DVR counselor. So if you don't know who that person is, um, ask your case manager or school counselor. Um, so that's DVR in a nutshell. Um, so I'm gonna let um, Jackie Borchard, who um, is the director of Vision Forward, um, Vision Forward, formerly known as the Badger Association of the Blind. When I was a kid, I grew up in Milwaukee and I used to go there um, and do Christmas shows um, a long time ago, but um, it's a great agency and I will let um, Jackie talk about what they have available. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate it. So as mentioned, my name is Jackie Borchard. I'm the Director of Operations at Vision Forward. We are a private nonprofit that is located in Milwaukee, um, but we do provide um, services across the state as needed. Um, and we do serve individuals of all ages. So our programming serves um, our littlest ones as young as a couple of weeks old, all the way through the senior population. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today specifically, um, as it relates to um, our presentation, is around some of the scholarship opportunities that we have. Uh, so Vision Forward is really pleased to be able to offer two different scholarships. Um, very important to note that there is just a single application for both of these scholarships so that when a student does apply, they don't need to identify which of the scholarships they are applying for. Um, the same application form is used um, for both scholarships. So our first scholarship is um, the Arthur L. Ebert Scholarship, and this is an endowed scholarship. So um, this family made a contribution to Vision Forward, and we are able to, on an annual basis, to be able to pull out dollars in order to offer this scholarship. As a result, um, the, the amount of the scholarship can change based upon the um, status of the investment, um, but historically it's been about $1,500 a year for that scholarship. In addition, we also have what we call our Vision Forward Scholarship. And this is a scholarship that is funded um, through our Vision Forward Foundation. So every year our board of directors um, votes on um, a withdrawal from our um, endowment in order to be able to supply um, $3,000 of scholarship monies um, in order to support uh, students who are looking to pursue post-secondary education. So um, I believe the information about the scholarship application has been shared, um, but I'm just going to point out a, a couple highlights. Um, so as you probably think about the math, um, we have a total of about $4,500 of scholarships in order to be able to provide on an annual basis. And the amount and the number of scholarship varies. Um, it's based upon decisions that are made by our scholarship committee. Um, so scholarships amounts can range anywhere from about $500 up to $3,000. Um, as I mentioned before, there's just a single application to apply for both of the scholarships. Um, obviously, since our, the point of our scholarships is to help to support students who are blind or visually impaired, um, an important part of the scholarship is that there is medical documentation um, of a visual impairment. Um, so there's information on the scholarship application um, about the different um, categories in terms of um, visually impaired, legally blind, um, and um, a form that needs to be completed by a medical professional in order to certify um, a visual impairment. There are a number of other components to uh, the scholarship application, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but just a couple highlights um, to David Hyde's point about um, the essay. Um, that is a really important part of the scholarship application, and I can tell you that it's the most heavily weighted of any of the components of the scholarship application. So as Dave mentioned, please take your time on this and do a really complete and comprehensive job and, and tell your story. I think it's such a great opportunity for the scholarship committee members in order to really get a sense of, of who you are as an applicant and what you're aspiring to do. Um, so please invest some time on that and, and really make sure that you can really portray a complete picture of yourself so that we can make good decisions around um, scholarship winners. Um, a really critically other point is I just want to make sure that as you're submitting the scholarship, please make sure that the scholarship is complete. We include a checklist and um, please utilize that checklist um, because um, if an individual doesn't provide all of the components of the that are on the checklist, uh, at a minimum, the, their maximum score will be de de decreased and potentially their scholarship application may not be considered um, if there's too many miss missing items. So that's kind of a, an overview of the scholarship. Um, as a reminder, um, again, this was included in the materials, um, but we actually have a little bit earlier due date this year, just with the hope of being able to announce winners and um, get the, the funds out to um, the universities or technical schools um, that the student is attending earlier in the process. So the due date for application for this year is May 21st, 2021. Just a couple other points I'd like to make. Um, David spoke about um, DVR services. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Vision Forward, uh, we do work closely with um, DVR consumers and provide 
um, many of those services um, that are covered under DVR. Um, so as Dave mentioned, orientation and mobility training, we have frequently gone out to university campuses in order to help students orient um, to a new campus and have gone out actually um, again in the future, oftentimes at semester when schedules change and where a student has to kind of learn new routes in order to navigate campus. Uh, we've also worked with students who have started to transition into more independent living um, through some daily living skills training in order to help them to be successful in maybe their first apartment um, or a new living situation in which they might need a little bit of training and support. And then obviously assistive technology is a huge piece of that successful transition um, into um, post-secondary education. So we're able to provide assistive technology assessments um, funded by DVR and able to make appropriate recommendations for um, technology that will help a student then to be successful as they transition. Finally, um, we have also worked closely with a number of university um, disability resource centers and have worked with those resource centers to both provide training to their staff, um, but also to assist um, if they do have students who are accessing services through the disability resource center, um, they have then reached out to Vision Forward in order to provide some of those supportive ser services to students on campus. So there's many ways in which we can assist. And um, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to Vision Forward if you think that there's any way that we can help um, as you make that transition on to um, that next stage of education. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. Denise, um, Denise Jess from Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visual Impairment. Um, Denise, could you take yep. about seven minutes? You bet, Dave. Thanks again so much for this invitation. This is really awesome to be able to talk with everybody this afternoon. So I am Denise Jess, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired, and great to hear about Vision Forward Scholarship Program as well. So the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired is a statewide nonprofit, and we've been around since 1952. The white canes that many of you may um, use or at some point in your life may be using um, come through the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired through our free white cane program. And as you graduate um, high school and move into college or wherever your um, life takes you next, you are eligible for a free white cane every two years. So if you have not personally ordered your own cane yet, if your parent has done it or somebody from school has done it for you, um, before you leave for college, um, please work with somebody in your life to order a cane from us so that you feel really confident to be able to do that on your own throughout uh, your lifetime. So we hope that as you um, move into adulthood and college and career, um, that you keep in touch with us just as Vision Forward can offer services, so can we, and um, including advocacy services on the state level to help change laws and policies that would really more positively benefit those of us who are blind and visually impaired. And so for today, I just want to focus on our scholarship program. The Council sees education as really vital for the success and empowerment of people who are blind and visually impaired. And so it's why we support scholarships um, with, a, with a really big heart. Um, we also have an endowment fund, so generous gifts from families over the years to be able to offer 10 scholarships per year and each of those scholarships is $2,000. So we are doing $20,000 a year in scholarships. We um, open that scholarship period now. It actually opened today. So um, you can apply for one of our scholarships at any point, and you can go to our website at wcblind.com. Dot org. So that's WCBLIND.org. 
and click on the or choose the scholarship um, and awards tab and download the um, application kit, which is all in Word and very accessible, all screen reader accessible. So uh, the scholarship is a competitive process. So we know that a lot of folks like to apply for it. We have uh, many folks apply for it each year and we can only award up to 10 and we will only award students who are really qualified for it. So the minimum requirements are that you have a GPA of 3.0 or better. You need to be a Wisconsin resident and we ask for proof of that residency um, in the application. You also need to um, have a vision impairment um, of 20 over 70 um, with best correction in the better eye or the field of vision of 20 degrees or less in the better eye. And just like vision forwards application, you need to verify that vision uh, impairment and you can do it through a medical professional or an educational professional. And that form is included in the packet. I can't echo enough the importance of really paying attention to that essay. We really are looking for our future leaders when we choose our scholarship um, recipients. We're investing in your success. We want to see you become folks in the community who are doing good work and who are really representing the blind and visually um, impaired community in the best light possible. So we are looking to quote unquote, meet you through that scholarship application. So uh, you'll notice that there's a question about your extracurricular or community activities. We wanna see well-rounded candidates. So you might have a marvelous GPA but have no experience um, you know, volunteering in the community or doing things um, extracurricular in your school. We wanna see that. Um, so there's a question about that in the uh, application. There's two essay questions. And again, those are your opportunity to really help us know who you are and how you imagine you can contribute to um, creating a better, a better world, basically. Really important to have your application materials in on time, including your letter of recommendation. So start early. You know, I know I have two college, well, one college age daughter and one who just graduated from college. So I've been on the mom side of this a lot saying, please start your applications, please start your applications, because inevitably something can get bumpy. You know, maybe your person that you asked for a letter of recommendation isn't getting it in right away and you have to remind them. Or maybe your teacher isn't getting your um, vision verification filled out in time. Or, wow, maybe the essay questions are harder than you thought and you need more time with them. So do not wait till the last minute to get things done. Start early um, so that, you know, you can even maybe turn that application in early. Our applications are due on Friday, April 9th. So Friday, April 9th is when all of those pieces are due. Then our scholarship committee um, will review those and score them and make decisions about who receives scholarships for the year. We'll notify you. Um, either way, we'll notify you about where you, where you stood in the process. We ask that those who are receiving scholarships um, attend, and this year will be virtual, a virtual celebration and re receipt of that scholarship so that you, know, you have an opportunity to shine in the community. We also hope that anyone who receives a council scholarship will stay in contact with us throughout the years. Many of our scholarship recipients um, become um, staff at the council, serve on the board, become volunteers, stay store customers or vision services customers, or somehow stay become donors, somehow stay in touch with us. And that's our hope is that we build a lifelong relationship with you.
So again, wcblind.org. And if you want to ask any questions today, that's great. If questions um, appear to you later, you're welcome to email me or call me and I can help you with the questions as can any of our uh, frontline staff. So thank you again, everybody, so much for this great opportunity to talk about our scholarship. Thank you, Denise. Um, I agree that they take a lot of pride in the scholarships. I frequently read about them in their uh, newsletters. I recently read about the young lady who's attending Whitewater for music. And um, when I worked there, I got to attend the banquets and met a lot of the scholarship winners. So that was really exciting. Um, so thank you both. Jackie and Denise. Um, we are pretty much on time since we started five minutes late. So I'm gonna take like two minutes just to talk about um, two things that I didn't talk about. And uh, one of them is the summary of performance, which is a piece, it's the last piece of your IEP that is completed, I believe, six months prior to your graduation. And the summary of performance is an important document for um, applying to, to get services for disability services at a college. Um, they don't want to look at long IEPs and decipher a lot of information. So the summary of performance is perfect because it's typically a two or three page document. It talks about um, your disability, your academic performance, and the accommodations that you've used in high school. And that is probably the most important piece because what the disability services um, offices going to want to know is the accommodations that you are requesting. And in order to provide those, they want to see a history that you've used those before in an educational setting. So that's a really important document. And um, it's best if the student um, fills that out along with the IEP team. There's actually um, programs for self-directed IEPs that um, have student-led um, completion of that. Um, and then the last thing is just the importance of the disability services. Um, and that's, I would suggest if you're considering a college or tech school that you contact that service, they're different um, at every institution. Um, the services they provide may be similar, um, but they may be quite a bit different. And again, I cannot emphasize the importance of self-advocacy because again, you need to request those services. It's not like, it's not like you have an IEP team that's going to say, oh, well, um, so-and-so used this accommodation in the past. Let's let's put this in the IEP, there is no such document. So um, you need to kind of work those things out and sometimes negotiate. So it's really important to get to know those people. And um, they often are a source of scholarship information. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and we have time for questions and answers now. So um, Jackie, do you wanna? unmute people, so. Sure. Uh, here we go. Um, yeah. So if people have questions, just uh, go ahead and ask. Um, this is Shana. Uh, I have the uh, process of getting up admitted to a college. And I just want to suggest that even when you're maybe taking a tour or you're just visiting the school to get in contact with that uh, director of the disability center, because when I did, it was a lot, it was more helpful than even sometimes uh, my guidance counselor at the school. And so they helped me through a lot. 
That's a great yeah. point. I totally agree with you. So thank you for sharing that. Hi, this is Kay. Um, in the chat, Faye asks if you can apply for these scholarships during junior year. So I can, this is Denise, I can speak to the um, Wisconsin Council uh, scholarship. Um, we ask that you are um, ha have a letter of acceptance from a school. So we need, we need to know where you're intending to go. And typically you don't have those letters of acceptance until your senior year. So most of the folks that we see apply for scholarships that are still in high school are graduating seniors. And this is Jackie from Vision Forward, and I'll echo what Denise has said. We do require that there is some proof of enrollment um, for the fall term. So in this case, it would be for fall of 2021. Um, so it would either be um, graduating seniors or individuals. We certainly expect, um, accept applications from non-traditional students who might be returning to school, even if there was mm -hmm. a gap in their um, education. Um, as long as there is proof of enrollment, um, they would be considered for um, a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And likewise with the FAFSA, um, I said that you can start applying for that October 1st, but I believe um, once you're given an award, I believe they're, they're not going to actually give you that until um, you have designated that you're going to a, a college. And then another thing I'll say is that a lot of scholarships um, require a student to have one year of college um, under their belts, like have attended one year of college before um, they can apply, but not all are like that. So, I know the good, ones. Good questions. The, I know the ones from the blindness organizations are for people who are starting college in the next academic year. So you, you for most of them, you ought to plan that you will apply when you're a senior. And as I said earlier, um, you, if you want scholarships the following year, you apply again because it's not, it, it doesn't roll over to the next year, the same as FAFSA. So every year you attend college, you need to complete that FAFSA the year prior. And Dave, that's a good point. We have had um, scholarship recipients who have won more than one year. Um, they may have won as a freshman and then applied again in subsequent years and gotten awarded a scholarship again. So um, certainly we encourage individuals to continue to apply on an annual basis if they're continuing to attend school. Yeah, Jackie, good point. This is Denise. And if you don't, um, you don't get an award one year um, it just may mean that, you know, there it was a very competitive pool and we needed to make some really difficult decisions. So we encourage you to apply in subsequent years. And we've had folks who were getting PhDs and law degrees who receive um, scholarships from us as well as entering um, you know, uh, freshmen. So, you know, please apply, or maybe you had a, a difficult year and your GPA dropped, but then the next year your GPA came back up, um, you know, it, the, and you qualify again, please reapply. Yeah, I'll definitely echo that. It, don't be discouraged if you don't um, get a scholarship through your first application, you know, please continue to apply um, because they're the, the overall um, kind of application pool um, can change greatly from year to year. So uh, I, I would strongly encourage individuals to continue to apply as long as they meet the requirements for the scholarship. The other thing I can't emphasize enough how important it is to talk with the, um, the people at the disability services and the um, financial aid office at the college that you're attending because a lot of colleges have scholarships just for that particular college. And um, even more so in grad school, when I was in grad school, um, I was the proud recipient of something called the Advanced Opportunity Program, which is a fellowship. And what that meant that I was funded, um, not from the start, but I think I received it the second semester and it funded me throughout the rest of my graduate program 
which was awesome because I didn't then didn't have to worry about funding it. Um, and there's also certain fields that um, I my master's degree was in rehabilitation counseling, and there was money also through the um, RSA Re Rehabilitation Services Administration. Um, there's often money for teachers through Department of Education. Um, so depending on what field you're going into, there may be money available. I did see a question in the chat um, in regards to the, um, the visual impairment uh, form. It sound, for, for Vision Forward, we do require that it is completed by um, a, a medical professional, ophthalmology, um, primary care physician, or an optometrist. Um, but I think, Denise, it might be different for you for your scholarship. I think you may have mentioned that um, a, a teacher can complete it as well. Exactly, Jackie. So you can ask your case manager, your TVI um, to com you know, complete it for you. We, we used to have it only medical um, professional as well. And then um, a couple of years ago, opened it up to other folks who would really have um, strong knowledge about your vision impairment. That's actually a very good point, Denise, and it's something I think I might take back to our committee to consider in the future because yeah, we thought it was theory. hard for yeah. our college students to get to yeah. into their ophthalmologists. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it creates a little bit more equity and ease, I mm -hmm. think. So that's awesome, Jackie, that you guys will consider that maybe. Yeah, uh, for this year, unfortunately, since the materials have already been released, we do have to stay with um, the current mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly something that we can look to consider for 2022, because I, I do like that distinction. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's Shana again. And to um, other students, when even if you are at the school for the blind or if you are at a uh, public school, uh, make sure that they really understand your accommodations, because uh I went to public school during AC, ACT time, and um, I didn't have all the correct accommodations. So just make sure that your IEP team and um, the people you're testing with really understand those accommodations. And also, if your first, the first time you take your ACT is doesn't go very well, just know that you can always retake them, which I am doing this year. Very good points, which is why it's important to not wait until your senior year to take the ACT. Because um, then if you Marianne, take it earlier, it gives you the opportunity to take it again. Marianne is raising her um, hand. Marianne. 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 Can't hear you, Marianne. Unmute yourself if you can, Marianne. I've been uh, trying to unmute her. I'm sorry. Hey. I unmuted the one button and not the other one. Double unmute buttons. So I'm talking to myself. I'm Marianne Barnett, and I am the Dave Bauman equivalent over at the um, Deaf and Hard of Hearing campus for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing kids statewide transition. But I'm also part of the WDB TAP. Um, deaf blind technical assistance project. So my question for the two, um, uh, one, the council and the, um, oh, the, I'm going to get the name wrong. Vision, vision forward. forward. Vision forward. Have there been recipients of either of those scholarships who have, um, have been uh, qualified as deaf blind? This is Denise from the council. We um, have, in my tenure, I haven't seen an application come from anyone who identifies as deaf blind, and we would gladly welcome someone who is deaf blind. Fabulous. And Jackie? Yep. Um, same for Vision Forward. Not to my knowledge, but we there was no reason why we wouldn't accept and welcome and encourage that application. I do know we've had individuals who have had um, visual impairment and other disabilities, um, and I know that's something that our um, Scholarship Committee has considered, you know, as um, has, has weighted that appropriately within their um, their consideration as well. So, yes, we would absolutely welcome and encourage um, students who are deafblind to apply. 
Great, thank you. I'm giving a, sort of a similar talk like this to um, professionals in the deaf and hard of hearing category and they want me to touch upon my work within WDB TAP so I want to be able to offer the, the two different scholarships that you two have talked about as well as that phenomenal cor uh, curriculum coursework that Dave mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Outstanding, thanks. Awesome. And Marianne, uh, from the national, I, I can't speak to the ones from the American Council of the Blind, but I'm sure they're very similar. I know that the uh, National Federation of the Blind has had over the years a number of deaf blind scholarship recipients. Okay, I'll write them down too. Bay has her hand up. Bay. Oh, I was wondering, I was, can you hear me? Yep. I was planning, I am a junior and I was planning to take some summer classes at Madison College over the summer. I okay. was wondering if any of these scholarships would apply for that since I'm technically going to a college, but I'm still, I'm, it's like just for a couple classes and it's not like a, a full. Sorry, thing. are you accepted to the college or is this through dual enrollment or? Um, it's just something I'm doing on the side and I haven't applied yet, but I was wondering if I applied, would these work? That's a great question. This is Denise from the council. Ours is, um, in most cases, is awarded to folks with full-time student status. Yes, I would echo that as well. We, we look to have individuals who are enrolled full-time. Okay, thank you. I would um, work with DVR on that because mm -hmm. I think that um, it falls in with what DVR does. I know somebody and I think um, the DVR helped. She went to Madison for um, summer classes as well. Cool. It's a great way to uh, help with the transition though. Glad you're glad you're taking summer classes. Uh, it's Shayna again, and just I'm going through all of this right now, so I have a lot of things that are popping in my mind. Um, with make sure if you're taking AP classes to make sure that check their accommodations as well for your AP test, because with the College Board, that's separate than mm -hmm. from the school. Great, Shayna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shana, this is Denise. You're um, you're right on the money with this advisement. You know, to make sure your accommodations are lined up for ACT or SAT, and also with the College Board for AP classes. As a mom with um, a kid who had an IEP, um, you know, navigating that and being ahead of the game on it, and knowing that they're not the same thing is really important. And making sure that your guidance counselor marks things correctly for your accommodation. So check and double check. So I highly encourage everybody to um, take a look at all of the resources because there's way more information in the resources than what um, we've talked about here today. Um, and again, that um, resource through the American Printing House. Um, I can't emphasize the importance of that, especially for teachers of the visually impaired and students. Um, and they, the Career Connect program has a lot of great re resources relating to um, job search, accommodations on the job, job applications. We've actually used that in our uh, employability program. Um, and a good friend of mine helped create that. So if you're reading it, it all refers to um, Florida, <laughs> University of Florida. Um, that's because he worked in Florida and attended college there. So that's why the reference is, but um, it's a, it's a great job and uh, again, APH has so many great webinars almost weekly. Um, they have webinars on assistive tech and um, 
stem things, all sorts of braille, all sorts of things. So I would encourage you to get signed up for their emails. Do you want to mention anything about the pre-survey and the post-survey? Oh yeah. Um, there's links in the um, information that you were sent with the with the Zoom link, right, Jackie? Yes, and I just shared the pre-survey link right now to the chat box. It's okay. also on the agenda. And did, did we say the post-survey is going out next week? Yes. Yeah, so um, if you could complete those, that would really help us um, know if we did a good job. <laughs> And um, if you would like more information, as I mentioned, um, you can do, um, I believe we call them virtual assistance requests now or, or outreach service requests to um, request transition services or parent liaison services. Um, there's other categories as well on there, but um, those are the ones that we've talked about today um, so that I'm able to work with students or families or teachers. Do we have any more questions? I do. No, there aren't any questions in the chat, nor are there any hands up. I think we're good. Well, once again, I thank everybody for spending your Friday afternoon with us and uh, last Friday in January. Um, so my contact information is on there, lots of resources. So hopefully um, for those students who attended, hopefully this uh, helps you and uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy job applying for scholarships, but free money never is easy. So um, take advantage of all of the resources that are out there. I think it's important to think about college applications and essays as a job and yep. to approach it with that type of seriousness. Yep. Yep. I agree. If you don't apply, you can't win. That's right. It, it's it's almost like uh, applying for a job where it's, you know, as um, our guest speaker said, it, it can be very competitive. Um, and I would equate the essay to an interview. Um, you know, a lot of times, People look very similar on an application, um, but sometimes the interview is what differentiates the applicants, um, similarly with the essay question. So. Probably also helps if they if people know you and know your, you know, character and performance and things like that. So again, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Dave and Dave and everybody else. Enjoy the snow. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Have Bye. a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.